the harvest. We're so glad that um, some of you joined us today in-house and some are, uh, are watching from your house. So praise God. We just love him, don't we? Um, I'm going to open today with Philippians 4, verse 4. So if you'd like to stand for the reading. You know, I know right now that we're a lot of us, maybe all of us, are, are really upset about what's going on in the world. Um, but we know that there are places we can go, things we can read that will bring us peace, that will bring us um, um, joy, and that will take our mind off of what's going on. So in Philippians 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So when you're down and you think about the Lord, rejoice. And let your gentleness, your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. You know, yesterday I was watching Sandy Fado and she told a story how at Walmart she was just kind to uh, a, a kid who was different. And the kid loved her and the mother heard about it and the mother came to meet her. And I just thought to myself, that was Jesus. And we need to be like that. Our gentleness be known to all men. So when you get upset about a political statement, you need to resort to your gentleness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And this is one of my most favorite verses. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So today, God is directing you, informing you that when you get nervous or worried about what's going on in the world, take out the scriptures and delve in and, and meditate on those and, and think about all the goodness of our God. He is so good. The world isn't, but our God is. So meditate on our God. So Jesus, I ask today, that the word that you bring forth will be anointed and holy and that it will bring more men to their knees, dear God, will bring us to revelation, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that your peace fills all our hearts every day. Amen. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. It's been since March for me. And as you all know, we've been involved with Jackie's care. In fact, I have to read, this is a, an announcement first from Emmy. Um, so many of you have been just so supportive, really prayer-wise, uh, financially, it's just been a real blessing to Emmy and her family and to us as well. It's been a difficult time for everybody. When you have difficulties on top of everything that's going on, it just, uh, some ways really makes it feel like you're piled on, but God's good, and he's doing mighty things. Uh, this is from Emmy. Huge Super Jackie James update. You see my t-shirt? Super Jackie James. He's turning five. This is a huge and incredible moment to celebrate. We want Jackie to feel as special and amazing that he is. So spread the word. Anyone who knows Jackie, loves Jackie, or just knows of Jackie, who would love to do a drive-by high buy due to the pandemic, no gifts, just your smiling faces, waves, and beeps of your horn are all that he needs. Uh, so plan to drive by to give this superhero an air high five anytime before 
7 p.m. this Sunday, August 9th, or any time before 7 p.m. on Monday the 10th, which is his actual birthday. Um, she said, thank you in advance for making this history-making boy smile. And she'll send a reminder the week before, too. But if you need his address, I have his address. I'm happy to give it to any of you. And if you are available to do a drive-by, uh, 7 p.m. Sunday, next Sunday, or 7 p.m. by 7 p.m. on Monday, I know it would thrill him. The fact that he's made it to five and they've given him really no alternative to make it to five, God's got a plan for Jackie. And he loves the Lord. I mean, that's the thing about him. He's so happy all the time. And he prays for Brock, who's going through his own issues. Many of you know and have been praying for Brock. Jackie prays for Brock because that's his special cousin. So that's my announcement. Um, I'm not going to share. I, I want to share a scripture. You know, we've been in the Psalms. It's been just incredible, hasn't it? With pastors' study and interpretation with the Psalms and the timeline that they've been following with our life, it's been just really incredible. It's been revelatory for me and I know for many of you. I've been reading the Gospels, too. I try to stay in the Gospels as well. And um, I'm going to be reading in Matthew. You know, one of the things that occurs to all of us at different times, and maybe especially during the times we're in right now, is, is the Lord really the Lord? How many are in a place that you come in and out of, like, God, what is going on and where are you? I know when I'm studying the Psalms, uh, as we're reading them, you, you feel good. You feel like God is really in touch with us. But there are times, you know, when we're in the world and we're in our daily life that sometimes it gets overwhelming with everything that's going on. And, we, and you know, with the Lord, he had 12 men with him that were just like us. They really were in and out of knowing who he was and not knowing who he was and being with him and then not being with him and just wondering, what are we doing? How many times as fishermen did they believe, you know, maybe we should just go back fishing. This is getting really difficult. Um, and seeing the attitude of the world as we're seeing it right now begin to change. And it's beginning to change towards the church. There's a real onslaught against faith right now. And I, I have to think the disciples were in the same situation. Um, in Matthew, and I'm in the 11th chapter, Jesus is really giving a dissertation beyond the disciples, but the disciples are listening, and I wonder how they interpret what he's saying. He goes on to describe um, John, uh, start in the 18th verse. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. We are his children. And it's the foolishness of the world that begins to point out sometimes who we are. They think we're foolish. Well, guess what? It's God's wisdom to define what wisdom is, and he gives it unto us. He goes on to rebuke all the cities that he had done miracles in that did not repent. And we have been in a season of repentance. It's been a really an embracing uh, act, I think, by this house especially. We've been hearing a bit about it for years and years, but I think we are all in the midst of repenting constantly to keep our hearts right. And as a prelude to partaking in communion, it's about repentance. It's about allowing God to judge our hearts. Well, he's judging the cities, it says in verse 20, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment 
than for you. The world isn't going to repent. The church has to repent. And really, we are laboring for the earth right now. We hear of all the areas that are really struggling. Nigeria, uh, Pastor Georgie just passing in Egypt, and we're praying for those disciples that he's raised up to continue that work. All the areas of the earth that are struggling right now, including the United States. And judgment is coming, and it's in the house right now. And, but then the Lord says, he says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, how do you answer your own declaration? Well, he does, because he one-ups himself, because he doesn't end in that note of judgment. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Are you glad this morning that Christ has been revealed to you and that you know the Father? I'm so grateful I know the Father this morning. Amen. Then he says, and this is where I want to end, and this is where if you are in this place, listen to what the Lord says. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you carry a burden this morning, whether it's what's going on in the world or your own family life, I have a lot that we're carrying right now, and I know because of the body of Christ, you're sharing our burden, and it's really making it easier to carry. But if you're, if you're carrying a burden that you're unable to today, Come unto him. You see, he's speaking a word of judgment. But to the house this morning, he's saying, come and rest. Learn of me. Sit at my feet. I'll supply what you need. So, Father, this morning, as we just open our hearts to you, we thank you for what you're doing in this hour, Lord. You are raising up a family, Lord, a kingdom in this earth that is going to be a banner of righteousness. And Lord, we know it is not without a cost. There is a mighty cost to pay. But Lord, we stand today and we say, because of you, the price you paid on that cross for us, Lord, to bring us to this place today. Lord, we repent. We repent for taking a hold of things and thinking we have control and we can change. Lord, we just come to you and we say, you change us, Lord. Touch our hearts. Reveal what needs to change within our own hearts and help us this morning, Lord. We thank you for what you've done. I thank you for the communion, the community that I am able to partake of this morning with this house, Lord. Grateful, grateful hearts. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus, who rules and reigns. Don't ever forget, he's on the throne. He's not asleep. He's not dismayed. He has everything under control. We need to rest. So, Lord, we enter into that place of rest this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Just received this uh, text um, four minutes ago from uh, uh, Tim Ashley. So I'm going to read it. Uh, Brethren, my beloved father-in-law, friend, brother, and fellow elder at Harvest Church here in Knoxville has entered his heavenly reward. Harry Gilreath was face to face with Jesus at 10 a.m. August the 2nd, 2020. He will be missed by all. That's his wife, Sheila's dad. He stood in faith right up till the end. Please rejoice with us in his reception into the manifest glory. Father, we uh, just stand together with Tim Sheila Harvest Church. Lord, we thank you that... Uh, Harry's time of suffering has ended and his promotion to be in your holy presence has begun. Be with the church and be with the family, Lord. 
strengthen them. As we always say, it's our loss and heaven's gain. But be with the family, Father. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. We have been praying, of course, for Harry for a while. All right. I've been reading Psalms and we've been reading Psalms. We're trying to read a Psalm a day. And uh, if you're reading with us a Psalm a day to correspond to the day of the year, and this is our second time around, that's how you get past day 150 and still keep reading a Psalm a day. And we are currently the Psalm uh, for today is Psalm 65. And uh, so if, if you, if you want to get on target with us, what we're doing is reading it, praying into it, studying it, talking about it, and uh, you're welcome to join us if you wish. I have people probably text me every day, what's our psalm today? And I'll text them back, say, well, it's Psalm 65. One of the things I've noticed, we're in book two. Uh, as I've mentioned, the Psalms are divided into five books that traditionally correspond to the five books of the Torah. So book one is the Genesis book, and book two is the Exodus book. We're on the Exodus book right now. But what I've noticed in book two in the Exodus book, uh, in five psalms that really uh, are ones that we're both on and are about to get on in book two from Psalm 55 through Psalm 68, the wings of the Lord or the shadow of his wings are, are mentioned. Is this, this is on, right? Okay. All right. And uh, as I was looking at the shadow of his wings, I just felt, um, since that's a, a discussion that's going on right now in the Psalms, that's a, a phrase that keeps popping up. I decided to look at the, the expression, the wings of the Lord, particularly the shadows of his wings. And I want to mainly talk about them in Psalms, but I want to give you a little background to this expression, the wings of the Lord, particularly the shadow of his wings. And we don't have to turn to all these verses. We'll turn to a couple. I, I, I wrote out the verses and, and uh, highlighted the main reference in that verse. We'll just do a little summary first, and then we'll look at a couple verses head on. The first mention of the wings of the Lord, or of wings, per se, is in Genesis 1, verse 21, on day number 5, God created the, the, the fish of the sea and created the, the birds and of the air, the winged creatures. Now, 5, in, in, in some understanding of biblical symbolism, is the number of grace. So that's, that's interesting it may suggest that from the beginning, God's wings speaks of his grace, his gracious intervention in our lives. Uh, in Exodus 19, verse 4, the Lord speaks of how he delivered the children of Israel on wings of eagles. So his wings speaks of his power to deliver his people. The Next reference is to the wings of the cherubim. The phrase, the shadow of God's wings, God's wings represent the heavenly creatures, the heavenly beings, the living creatures who stand around his throne, who bear his throne uh, on their shoulders, who overshadow the, the mercy seat of the Lord, his throne, who carry the Lord. He's carried along on the wings of the wind as he rides his chariot through the earth 
establishing his authority. So the wings of cherubim speak of that, that supernatural authority that the Lord has to bring order to human events. Of course, we see the wings of the cherubim mentioned in Exodus 25, 20, Exodus 37, 9, in reference to the tabernacle. And then we also see that in 1 Kings 8, verses 6 and 7. The, the cherubim was over the, the ark in the temple of Solomon. I want to look at Deuteronomy 32. That one we'll look at because this is shows how the, the wings of the Lord speak of, of a number of things when it comes to God dealing with his people. Um, you can pick up Deuteronomy 32. Let's, let's pick up verse 8. To get the context, when the Most High God, Deuteronomy 32, 8, gave all the nations of the earth their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel, which also in other translations or texts as the sons of God, the angelic beings. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted inheritance. Remember, Moses is speaking in Deuteronomy on the verge of the people entering into the land to obtain their inheritance. Uh, that's the, the, this culmination of Exodus, uh, the journey out of Egypt and into the land. And as they're about to go in the land, he's rehearsing their history. In a desert land, the Lord found his people. In a barren and howling waste, he shielded and cared for his people. He guarded his people as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young and spreads its wings to catch them. There's the wings of the Lord. Again, once again, likened to an eagle. An eagle protecting an eagle catching them when the eagle throws them out of the nest to teach them how to fly. And it continues and carries them on its pinions. It's talking about protection. The Lord alone led him. No foreign God was with him. The, the wings also speak of guidance. He made Israel to ride on the heights of the land and fed him with the fruit of the field. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag. It speaks of, of, of the wings of the Lord is what causes us to rise up and fly. Of course, we know in Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord will be like those who rise up and mount up into the skies on wings of eagles. The eagle has the ability to fly the heavenly heights. So the wings of the Lord is what, what causes us to fly. And, and the, the imagery continues how God feeds his people. All of this is behind the wings. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, the, the wings uh, have to do with Ruth, who is a non-Jew, coming under the protective wings of Boaz, the Jew. It, it talks about conversion. It, it talks about moving into the, the places of the Lord. About becoming part of God's people. His, his wings symbolize that. I want to look at Isaiah chapter 6. Let's go to Isaiah 6. Just as we speak of the wings of the cherubim, over the mercy seat, and I remind you a second time, the mercy seat is God's throne. The mercy seat was where God was seated in the Holy of Holies, where he resided and he presided. He resided with his people, presided over them. That is a chair, and the wings of the cherubim overshadow that chair. That chair is the throne of the Lord. Always remember this. God rules and reigns. His throne is a 
mercy seat. He rules out of mercy. He rules out of graciousness, not out of violence, not out of force, not out of the way the world construes power. The Lord's power is in his mercy, is in his grace, is in his forgiveness, is in his tender heartedness. It's in his devotion to us, his covenant faithfulness and love. And so Isaiah, his very commission, is tied in with the wings of the Lord. Isaiah's commission in Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that King Uzziah died. See, the king dies. And of course, when a king dies, and remember, Uzziah reigned many, many years. I mean, this is talking about a 60-some year reign. That's a lot of stability to have the same leader for 60 years. And so when a king dies, there's instability. Oh, except there's not instability because in the year that King Uzziah dies, the Lord reminds Isaiah he's the real king of the people. There's been no transfer of power. There's no instability. He's the king. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. And if his throne is his mercy seat, then Uzziah, who, I mean Isaiah, who's in this midst of this vision, this theophany of the Lord, he's in the temple. So he sees the Lord on his throne on the mercy seat. I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robes filled the temple. He sees the Lord first, he sees the throne, and then he sees the seraphim, the supernatural heavenly beings. The next thing he sees are wings. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. And of course, we know that they were flying and they were covering themselves and they were calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Do you see where we're headed? When the Psalms talk about being under the shadow of his wings, they're talking about all of these incredible things that the wings stand for in Scripture. In Isaiah 8, verse 8, Assyria who's actually coming in to invade Israel. Don't have to turn. I'm going back to summary. Isaiah 8.8, 8, unless you want to, unless you're fast. Assyria is the wings of the Lord being brought in to judge Israel. Assyria is coming in to bring correction to his people. The wings of the Lord also have to do with correction and judgment. But keep in mind, as James tells us, mercy the throne and the mercy seat triumphs over judgment. God's judgment is mercy. In Isaiah 11, verse 12, he's gathering Israel from the four wings of the earth, the four corners of the earth. It's also interesting. Wings is the term used for the borders of the garments of the Jews, where they would have their tassels, where they would be reminded about the commandments of the Lord, when somebody would come under the skirt of someone else, the garments of somebody else, it had to do with redemption. Uh, when the Lord placed his skirt in Ezekiel over Jerusalem and Israel, it has to do with his mercy. And in Zechariah 8.23, when the, all the nations of the earth are going to grab hold of the skirts of someone who's called a Jew, the skirts speak of the borders of the garment, the wings of the garment. And we also understand that God's wings are the borders of his glory coat, of his glory robe that he wears. And when we come under those, we grasp a hold of them and we receive redemption and we receive protection and we receive authority to move in the nations of the earth. So when Israel's being gathered from the four wings of the earth, the four corners, it's, it's the Lord even sees creation as being the borders of his garment. What's the universe to the Lord? He puts the universe on. Scripture talks about it. Psalms talks about it. The Lord puts the universe on like a garment, and when it's an old garment, he gets rid of it and creates something new. The shadow of God's wings, brethren. His wings 
speak of his authority and his power. In Jeremiah 48, 40, he spreads his wings over Moab to judge Moab. He not only uses Assyria as his wings to judge Israel, but he judges the enemies of God's people with his wings. In Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel 11, the wings of the cherubim. When Ezekiel is called, it's just like Isaiah is called. He sees the Lord on a chariot and the cherubim bear up that chariot of the Lord. A chariot is the is the the an instrument of, of war. It's an instrument of travel. The, the incredible thing about Ezekiel is remember the Jews taught up to the time of the exile that the spirit of prophecy existed only in Israel. And when they were removed from Israel, the spirit of prophecy stopped. See, that's why the ancient nations used to exile people from their native land. You know, they just, what they did was they just, they, they shuffled the deck. They'd conquer this nation and put this people over in Israel. They'd conquer Israel and put Israel over in this nation. They did that because it was a common belief of the ancient Near Eastern peoples that their God's authority only extended the boundaries of their land. So that when you remove the people from their land, you remove them from the authority of their God. And that's why they would put them in another land and subjugate them to, to their authority. Assyria did it to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Babylon did it to Judah and Benjamin. And so the first thing Ezekiel sees, he's at the river Kibar. He's in Babylon, and he sees the Lord on a chariot with wheels. The Lord's like, nah, you can be pulled from my land. Guys, I exercise authority over all the universe. I'm the true God. Don't worry about that you've been removed from the land and the spirit of prophecy is gone. And so the cherubim go with God's people, the wings of the Lord. He goes with his people in their righteousness. He goes in their unrighteousness. He goes with them in their obedience. He goes with them in their disobedience. He goes with them when he's blessing. He goes with them when... He judges, and that's the wings of the Lord. As soon as Ezekiel saw the wings of the cherubim, he said, oh my gosh, it's the Lord on the throne, and it's a portable throne. He goes with his people where they are. Do you understand the significance? The gods of the nations, their gods, the gods of the religions of the world, they desert their people when their people are disobedient. Not our God. See, that's the amazing thing. Oh, Pastor Oz, why are you talking about judgment? God doesn't judge. Yes, he does judge. And he goes with his people when he judges. See, that's what the cross is all about. See, Jesus spread out on the cross. Do you understand what that is? His wings. They're the wings of the Lord being spread out over the whole universe, saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He, he's taking them under the shadow of his wings on the cross. He weeps with those who weep. He rejoices with those who rejoice. And he never deserts his people. So when we say the judgment of God is here in this nation, in this world right now, good news. Good news. Let's not try to escape the judgment by creating a fantasy world that says judgment's not here. Yeah, COVID-19 is not real. Christians are saying that. But the civil unrest, injustice, racism, well, that's not real. Christians are saying that. The economic breakdown, no, no, economy is going to do better than it ever had. We all want to normalize our fantasy, whatever our fantasy interpretation is, instead of saying, no, no, the shadow of his wings, he's with his people, wherever. So in judgment, in blessing, in anything in between, in confusion, he is with his people. I will 
never leave you nor forsake you, says the Lord. Matthew, his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us, where that, where that prophecy first came forth, Emmanuel. Where the prophecy first came forth, Emmanuel was in Isaiah chapter 8, when God says, oh, here come my wings, Assyria. I'm bringing judgment on Israel. But Ahab, or uh, Ahaz, you're going to have a son and name him Emmanuel, God with us. It's the start of Matthew, end of Matthew, Matthew 28. Go forth and make disciples of all the nations, and behold, I am with you always. Let's take a couple minutes and go to the Psalms. I, I really want to look at book two. The, 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 the five Psalms where the wings of the Lord are mentioned in book two. And we won't have a long Pastor Oz message today. See, it's funny, when we're outdoors, I was talking to the brethren, I do short messages outdoors. You thought, like, amazing. And then I go on and on and on and on and on when we're indoors. And Pastor Andrew gave me the word. It's because I get in my, this is like normal to me. And I'm like, oh, yeah. This is where I speak an hour, isn't it? And people are like, yeah, if you have a short message. Book two. Book two is the Exodus book. Book one is the Genesis book that speaks of beginnings and new beginnings of God's people. Book two is the Exodus book. It speaks of the deliverance of God out of Egypt and the beginning of the journey toward the land. When you look at it structurally, book one is about David, book two is about Solomon. Book three is about the divided kingdom. Book four is about the Israel in exile. And book five is about Israel returning to the land. The five books of the Psalms are all set in order to relay Israel's history from the time of David to the time of the restoration of the exile pointing to David's son, the Messiah. Isaiah 55, or uh, Psalm 55, verse 6. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. The wings of a dove. And it's the shadow of his wings or the wings of a dove in book 2 that will be highlighted. This is the Lord through David, there's David's doing a series of psalms that says, deliver me from my enemies. Psalm 51 is the first psalm of David, and it's the first enemy we all have to be delivered from. Sin. You know, we look outside for our enemies, but the first enemy is inside. It's our sin. In Psalm 52, the enemy is Saul. David's enemy Saul is spoken of, and Saul speaks of people in power who abuse us. Internal enemies we need to be delivered from, external enemies. Psalm 53 is a third kind of enemy, a foolish enemy, an enemy who gets their, gets off by making things difficult for God's people. That's a fool. They love to challenge God's authority, and the way they challenge God's authority is by going after God's people. That's a third kind of enemy. In Psalm 54, it's the enemy. David befriends the Ziphites, and the Ziphites betray him. It's about helping people, and the very people you help betray you. May I just make a statement? Welcome to Pastoring 101. My pastors told me in the Lord, when I was just a young believer training for the pastorate, they, they told me, they said, the people you help the most will be the per people who most violently turn on you and against you. It's the way of Jesus. Who turned on him? Everybody he helped. 
So we get to Psalm 55, and now this is about the betrayal of a close friend. And in the midst of all of these enemies that David is crying out, be my deliverer, he says, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert, Selah. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Was was what, what Pastor Jan was talking about when she opened in Saul, uh, Philippians 4. We all need a place to go, don't we? And you know that place we go? The wings of the Lord. He gives us the wings to go places. Do you need to be another place than where you are right now? Cry out to God as David did in the Psalms. Give me the wings of a dove. Psalm 56 57, and so on, continue some of these themes. Psalm 56 speaks of the final enemy that David deals with, and that's the Philistines. That's the powers and principalities. That's the wicked, demonic forces that seek to remove us from the land of our inheritance. 57, 58, and 59, three do not destroy psalms. Psalm 57, David is called not to destroy his enemy Saul, but to trust God concerning his enemy Saul. And 57, 1 starts like this. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. The disaster that the wings were sparing him from was Saul. Saul was David's father-in-law. He wasn't Harry Gilroy, okay? Saul was his father-in-law. Saul was his king. Saul was his mentor. Saul was his shepherd. And that has to hurt when someone in that position turns against you. David knows he's supposed to be the king. Saul is pursuing him. And David comes upon Saul. This is what it says in the superscription. For the director of music to the tune of Do Not Destroy of David, a Worshipful teaching psalm. That's what a miktam is. When he had fled from Saul into the cave. He finds Saul in the cave. David comes on Saul. Saul is taking care of some business. He doesn't know that David is there. David's right hand man says, he's pursuing you. He's the king who's being deposed. You're you're the one, David. You're, you're going to win the election, David. You're, the, you're God's man. He doesn't see you here. God has given him into your hands. Take your sword out and slay him. David looks at him and says, I, I can't do that. I can't slay my father-in-law. I can't slay my king. I can't slay the Lord's anointed. That's in God's hands. See, even... The people who hurt us, we want vengeance against them. We want them to pay. Uh Uh-uh. Not of God. David is suggesting something huge here. He's saying God will take care of it, but he's not saying God will take care of it and judge Saul and put me as king. He's saying, I hope, this is what I hope for my enemy. God will restore him and that he'll be king. Can you do that about your enemies? Can you do that about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Family members, they're the ones who hurt you the most. Can you be like David? You know, it's shortly after this experience, God gives the kingship to David. See, that's the final test you pass. Oh, we want to be an apostolic church with apostolic authority, Lord. Well, the final test to pass is how will you utilize the power I give you? For mercy like me, 
under the shadow of my wings, under my mercy seat. How will you be? Will you pass that test or will you say, I can't wait till I get power and they'll get theirs. I, I, I instruct believers over and over and over again. They've got these, somebody's going to get theirs because they hurt me issue in their heart. And I'm like, no, get rid of that demon spirit until you want to bless your enemies. And by blessing your enemies, you just, well, don't let good things happen. No, David's saying, may Saul be restored and I never be the king. That's the test. That's what the shadow of his wings does. Let's, let's, let's close. I'm, I'm 11.58 already. See, here I go again. Psalm 61. Verse 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shadow of your wings, Selah. 63, 7. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. How do we know when we're in his shadow? God stirs worship in our hearts. We sing to him. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. And finally, we'll close with where all this started. Psalm 91. We keep praying Psalm 91 over our families. Lord, I pray Psalm 91 over this church over the families, over our families, over our friends. No COVID-19 in the name of Jesus. And those who get it, they recover in the name of Jesus. Psalm 91, we close. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now the shelter, the shadow, it's his wings. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. There it is, COVID-19. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Lord Jesus, thank you for the shadow of your wings. We abide under that shadow. We abide under that shelter. We abide under that protection. We abide under that oversight. We abide, Lord. We abide under that protection and guidance. And Lord, the final reference to your wings is Malachi 4, verse 2, and I declare that. The Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Let it be so for us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we give you praise and honor, Lord, for such an awesome message. In the beginning, Lord, reflecting on gentleness, and I thank you, Lord, we all need to be remembered of gentleness. And Lord, even with Pastor Philip, we are sometimes overwhelming in our situations, Lord, and wondering where you are and you are right here. And so Pastor Oz, bring that thing full circle. In the shadow of your wings, Lord, let us dwell there, Lord. Let us remember, Lord, that even to pray that others be in the shadow of your wings, God. Let the word that was spoken today, let it penetrate our heart. Let it be manifest through our lives and through our words that we speak. Let it be glory to you, Lord, and let it bring joy to you. In Jesus' holy name, we give you praise and honor. Amen.